Awesome. So this is a pioneering prototyping early bird version of Pick Jerry's Brain. Uh, it's also just a friendly conversation to figure out what's what, like, what are some of these things in the middle? Mm -hmm. uh, and I will likely, if, if it's okay with you, use some of these clips uh, as, hey, here's what this thing actually is. And here's how the conversation sort of works and, and so forth. And, and we'll see. Um, Sounds great. But the idea is to sort of overshare a little bit with the brain and to use it as a blackboard for a conversation in some sense. And if you at some point want to share, screen share and come in with uh, stuff that you've got or, or whatever else, because it fits into the conversation, feel free. Don't feel, don't, don't feel like I, I must show the brain and I've got like, like, like this compulsion to do so because partly what I'm interested in is making this a, a juicy and fruitful conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, so that when we both like hang up the zooms, uh, we're like, oh, okay, that might like, now I know where to go. And, and uh, Stacy was on a call this morning with, uh, we were with Pete Kaminsky and uh, I was pursuing some of the, how do we make progress on building the little tiles that fit the mosaic? And then he said, well, I'm not sure I'd do that. I'm like, what do you mean? And then he said, kind of need to like paint a compelling vision of where you're heading to motivate everybody. Think knowledge navigator video. And I'm like, wasn't on my radar. <laughs> makes complete sense mm -hmm. is like looking at my little tiles and mosaic metaphor backwards because i've been coming at it from the individual tiles piece trying to say mm -hmm. hey programmers uh, and i'm not a programmer if you could define program tiles that we can fund somehow they'll come together into this mosaic mm -hmm. uh, and, and then i don't know did you see the six layer drawing that i did that was sort of the mosaic mm -hmm. okay yeah that that shows that they're all individual layers and yeah Yep. and how to see that and tilt it and turn it and see the connections. And I think that's a part of our conversation here in some sense, because, because I have a funny feeling that your tapestry in some senses feels is a exactly bit, that. Mm. Yeah. So, so his, yeah, I had his, you in mind when I started laying it out, I was like, Oh, this goes back to Jerry's picture. Fabulous. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah. And I'll, what I'll, I might share the screen with uh, some of those images, which are still hand-drawn. I've been trying to redraw them on diagrams.net, but I haven't gone back and finished the the diagramming but mm -hmm. but but the idea uh kind of is to make them available as svg or some other format files so that we can in fact stack them and, and look around at them and then and then in a in a dream environment in my wish list future in a feature that may show up in the video idea that pete gave us this morning mm -hmm. um you one of those layers would come out of trove Mm -hmm. and basically be a map in trove and and you know vincent is like well we already do this little funny primitive graph view what else could we do and i'm like mm -hmm. hmm. you know and 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 so forth and then and then how these things connect to each other gets really rich and interesting and becomes a live manifestation of our map yes as opposed to somebody's hand-drawn thing that will never be up to date in the future yes. which is not yes. what we really want we kind of right. want a living document Yep. Right. Yep. Um, okay. So, so what's the vision? So I think maybe, <laughs> yeah, well, there, there's sort of two different, uh, there's many different questions, two different questions, yeah. maybe to approach this. Um, I should shut up and ask you where you're pointing and what, like, like how you're trying to go about it. The two questions I'm thinking about is like, what's the vision is kind of the, 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 the fun, big picture kind of question. But then yeah. under that, there's the what's a methodology or what's a way to get there or how are you seeing uh how are you seeing elaborating this and getting other people to be like yeah and then jump in and say this is my part and this is how i fit yeah yeah right? okay there's so many layers there right yeah so exactly. i i like to start big picture and work down so is that cool that sounds great and in the meantime okay. i'm going to just start a little bit of screen share and then turn it off but i basically yeah. i basically created a thought called helping communities see themselves uh, mm -hmm. and put under it your, but the only link I have sort of to your tapestry project here, and uh, that's under you and under what everyone's wisdom initiatives. And you had mentioned this on our OGM check-in call uh, mm -hmm. last Thursday, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, so I connected that to the OGM multi-plane mosaic. And then I just created a storyboard, which is empty right now, but I created a slides deck in which I might start building a storyboard for the knowledge navigator equivalent video for OGM for, mm -hmm. because because I realized that I'm busy trying to get people to, to create tiles, but I haven't painted the mosaic yet. Right. And so, and so 
this is as background for our conversation. Yeah, and um, I agree with Pete on the larger scale that having a vision is important because it helps in, in all my time working with volunteer people too. And that's, that's what we're talking about, right? It's not one person saying, here's where we're going. And everybody goes, okay, I don't agree, but okay. Right. Right. That we have that people can then decide this. I agree with that vision or not. That's the first level of decision. Right. And then it's what part of the things that I'm working on fit into the vision of where this is going. And I will then happily contribute those things or not. Right. And what parts don't that I'm going to continue to do on the side. So it gives people an, an independence in choosing whether they're going, instead of, instead of everyone kind of being in the space of wait and see, always wait mm-hmm. and see. Right. Um, so yeah, I think it, a vision draws people to draws people in. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, the biggest vision that's really come up is started with that conversation about the better verse. Mm-hmm. So I was just looking at Jerry's brain in terms of the better verse too. And I know that Pete put together a whole uh, wiki, you know, massive wiki about it as mm-hmm. well. And I think that that, um, if you haven't linked to that yet, I, that I would find valuable in Jerry's brain is to have okay. a link to, because there's a little more sense making. I don't know what the right word is for it, but there's a little more context within what, what Pete pulled together for us. Uh-huh. Um, so I don't think I have a massive wiki page for the better verse conversation. Um, I know we had the episode, I know we had the conversation in the, we had the OGM call. Maybe it was, there were three, I feel like we've had three really good conversations in OGM. One was the better verse, one was more recent, and maybe there was a third somewhere along the the line. So first there was a metaverse conversation, and then two weeks later we did the better verse conversation. So that's these, that's these two here. Okay. And then since then we didn't really, we, we had the money and the money conversation that Grace led. Yeah, which was um, great, but not not what I was thinking of. Um, but not on this topic. We might have to talk to Pete about which was the one that he actually. I might have it. Hold on. It could also have been our sense doing call. It could also have been this one. Um, uh, possibly, yeah. Possible. So there's useful questions about sense making. This is the, is it the call where Ken put these questions in the chat? Here, let me go back to you. Yep. Um, this is the free Jerry's brain call for oh, yeah. November 22. Mm, that's fine. How do we harmonize? Our... Is perfect. <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> I just, I, 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 I still have yet to go uh, back. Oh, that's me playing. I'm yeah, so yeah. sorry. You're playing yeah, the episode. Funny. That's funny. Um, yeah, that was a free Jerry's brain call. Um, that, uh, Stacy said I should watch that is, that was a month ago and it's still up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I have um, yeah, Stacey I'm said not I should watch a, a Daniel Schmachtenberger pot, Spotify podcast, which is still open in a tab in my browser. Sorry, yeah. Stacey. Yeah, we've got um, 20 tabs open. Um, yeah, so there was another one. Anyway, I think the conversations we've been having around what does this thing look like? What do we want it to look like? And I don't mean it as an OGM. I mean it as in the shift towards something better. You know, What is the better thing that we're talking about? Um, And that's really kind of where I live all the time. So that's the question I'm always kind of, you know, moving with and, and, and engaging with and trying to make decisions around. So getting smaller now, the tapestry project for me is a way that we can use technology that exists today. We don't need to worry about developing something new in letting people, letting communities see their own story. Um, which is the pieces you already have in there. Um, and I think help then to elevate a conversation to another level. So we can stop having the conversation uh, at the basic level about what it is that we would like to have happen, which is more individualistic and start to see how it combines together. So we can see as a community, what is it that we're talking about? And for me, the way that things manif- have manifested already are say that money, you know, the money conversation where there was that great mirror board that Grace put together or someone, I guess someone put it together, right? Where you're seeing some of the frameworks that are already being developed or, or, you know, in, in small part or in large part towards helping people understand what economies could come forward that might help either Mm -hmm. in small community settings, larger 
larger um, worldwide settings and everything in between. And I think that those, even though we haven't figured out the perfect answer yet, even just educating people are like, here are five leading frameworks that are that are leading the thought on where this could go and is inspiring, right? If you're a person that likes economics, then this is inspiring. Or if you're a person who has a business that's starting to hit up against these issues, going and seeing, oh my gosh, thank God there's people thinking about this. Just knowing that is yeah. super, super hopeful. So in my world, I, you know, as a, as a real low hanging fruit, I see the tapestry as being a place where we can place some of those resources and make it in an immediate sense-making research rich environment for people to at least start or mm -hmm. at least orient themselves. And then they can decide from there where they want to dive in instead of us feeling like as a community, we're still making the same recommendations and we're still, we're still throwing out the same resources because we feel it's important each of us feel like it's important that everyone else knows about this. Well, now we'll feel, huh, we've got that. That's checked off. That's over here. It's in yeah. our repository and anyone can get access to it pretty easily, right? And find it for themselves pretty easily. So now what? Okay, now what? It's the, what about the people in the room here? What kind of expertise do they have? And maybe I know just a little bit about each person um, and maybe from what they say in the, in the calls, I can kind of sense, but I don't, certainly don't know the whole picture. Um, and a lot of people have had different jobs that have taken them in different directions and maybe have, right. And so instead of, I, I keep hearing from um, community leaders, whether it's you or Pete, or even like Jamaica Stevens from OFC, or I've heard this uh, from Lauren and Charles back with K Kiko Lab. Oh, I see how everyone really connects and I'm waiting for you guys to figure out how you connect to each other. And that's fine. I would like to see that happen faster. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think we can provide a bit of a framing for people to find each other and find um, just connections more quickly than what they decide to do. With those connections is out, in my opinion, outside of the realm of technology. Right. That that is them reaching out to each other or or it falls on the community. If they find out that 25 people um, are all interested in a particular topic, either because they have expertise or they just have general interest that would be a great pop-up call. Right. Right. So, exactly. but we can't even begin to go there because we don't know, we don't know those pieces of information. So to me, that's how we start that the tapestry is a platform is one view of data that allows us to ask new questions or to come to new conclusions that then elevates a conversation towards the better verse, you know, and these sense that a lot of the people are working in those areas to begin with, right? It, enabling the people in these calls to do their work better is certainly elevating all of us towards that, mm -hmm. towards that answer. So in that sense, I see the tapestry as being some of the mortar. It's not a piece, right? The pieces go in it. It's, it's the platform. It's the framework. It's the, <laughs> right? Um, so then it's really about, um, conceptually, that's great. But then what has this work practically? And that was your other, the other part of your question. And for me, the practical side of it is um, how do we have people who are not familiar with technology or don't like using it, don't want to, won't, won't, won't persevere through the friction of learning yet another system or another whatever. Um, can we use a questionnaire that helps them just answer questions about themselves and we place the pieces in the tapestry mm -hmm. for them. Then I think once they see where they fit in the tapestry, having a way for them to edit it. Oh, I didn't, I see where I landed on the map. I didn't mean there. I meant over here, right. you know, right. now that I see that the, the whole, um, and allowing them to change it if they, if they need to, and then allowing them again, to see themselves, um, you know, beside other people then mm -hmm. helps them learn things immediately about the community. Um, whether they decide to take it to the next step and see the community as a whole and start asking these other questions, not everyone's gonna do that. That's not everyone's thing. Um, I have been working with Vincent on this. It's my intention to have it be a part of Trove. Um, and so he and I are working really closely together, whether it could also be say an external app standalone kind of on its own somehow, or open source standalone kind of on its own somehow, um, or other communities can then benefit from it in whatever way serves them. I'm all for that. I think the more 
the more is better. Mm -hmm. In which case we all benefit because then if there was one place where we could start layering all the communities on top of each other and then filtering that for all the expertise or all the people interested in this topic or all that, right? Then you really start to, the interweaving really starts to get rich. Um, and of course the challenges with how, how we filter it and how we, <laughs> how we can sense make it without much data data obviously becomes an issue, but. Right, right. So my questions for Jerry's brain then are kind of on all those levels. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, we could, I, I'd be interested in pick Jerry's brain for, you know, what, what should the X, Y, and Z axis look like? Um, so starting there, for me, the X and Y are fluid. Actually, it's all fluid. In my mind, it's all fluid, which is also interesting because most, most data guys do not want to, or, or women, mm -hmm. uh, people who work with data do not want things to be fluid. They, they want most data humans. So it's like yeah. trying to, they want it to be like, no, there's a one-to-one -one correlation between the data and where it goes. And I'm basically saying, no, there, it can be right. Somebody could put a piece in multiple places because that for them, it makes sense to be in more places than once on this particular area of expertise. But I also see the X and Y uh, axis changing either because of, of its fractal nature, people can zoom in to things basically, um, or zoom out to get a bigger picture. And zooming in may just mean, you know, taking the y-axis and um, instead of it being a holistic framework of all of society, which I'm currently currently using as the example, it could be just a framework around economics or just a framework around governance, um, so that people can then discern even more all the projects, expertise, and all the layers um, inside that. So, you know, there's a whole conversation still to be had around what those, what are maybe some suggestions for organizers or community leaders to create a tapestry for their own communities, what their X axis would be, what their Y axis would be and what their Z axis would be. Um, to me, the X and Y sit flat, shifting a little bit, X and Y sit flat. And then from that visual that you were talking about that you created, the layers, the Z axis is the layers of the sheets. And for me, each one of those is a contribution, is people answering questions about themselves. To me, those are the pieces that go in the flat grid, right? And then you have one layer that's people's interests. You have another layer that's people's expertise. You have another layer that's um, people's questions. You have another layer that's people's stories. And to I'm starting to realize that it probably is best if the entire tapestry is what I have to bring to a community and less about matchmaking, like less about let people do the matchmaking is what I've been thinking lately mm -hmm. <laughs> and have um, let humans do that piece because they may be really interested in making a connection that, that um, the computer AI, when they matched up, didn't even see. Right. So right. I'm, I'm trying to it, also the way we phrase things in terms of um, what I have to offer and what I need can sometimes be the same. I have a job to offer. I need someone to come and work for me is the actually the exact same thing. So I was trying to get, also get away from that. Um, Vincent pointed that out and I thought it was really valuable. So I, I, um, I think it's easier and cleaner if the whole tapestry is here's what's available. Like here's what I'm offering up. And then the people viewing it are viewing it for a need, right? They're right. trying to research into something. I think it makes it cleaner and easier, but that's kind of where that sits. So there's my leading edges. Um, fabulous. And I've been tapping a bunch of stuff into the chat, which I sort of want to go back through and then weave into the, the brain and into the conversation. Yeah. Uh, but uh, like the largest thing of, of those notes is um, one of my insights from curating one mind map for 24 years was that we are an amnesic civilization. And I have a video that I, um, I shot some time ago that says, basically, um, I, I, basically, I have a hunch that nobody is having the information curating experience that I'm having. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a feeling that, that, that living in a one, so here's, we are in a, in a music society. Uh, I'm going to link that actually to our conversation right now. I've created mm -hmm. a thought for this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, so here we are, here's the tapestry project and the multiplane mosaic. Uh, but this idea that um, we keep repeating the same, we keep repeating the same conversations over and over again because we don't have a shared memory. Yes. Right. Uh, and that's that's really terrible. We, we've outsourced our memory to Google and Wikipedia, which is a problem. Uh, and then I think I found the the thought I was thinking about. 
uh, lack of shared memory makes us easier to spin and manipulate. Mm -hmm. And this is a really important yeah. thing right now because we need to not, we need to undo the spin and we are all drowning in the info flood. And one of the tactics of, of sort of destabilizing forces is to flood the zone with, with bullshit, basically, is, is, is the way it's said. So I'm coming at this from a different direction, but um, I think that there's a, one overwhelming thing is that a shared memory, a tapestry that we can weave together that is trusted, that we can, that represents us, would be a, just a giant step forward for, um, how we know what we know and what we rely on, like what, what, mm -hmm. what information we can trust and all that. Mm -hmm. I think for the mind, it's resting. Like you were saying, it's overwhelming yeah. to think about all the resources. And I do think that everyone's feeling that no matter what age or what experience people have had with social networks, I think just the volume of information, the volume of choices, the volume of things to look at and to, and to absorb is, incredibly overwhelming when you, when you don't have a place to put it, right. Which is why we all have a million tabs open, right. It's, it's, it's not that I, first of all, I know if I close the tab, I'll never go back. Mm -hmm. Um, if I have the tab open, I'm not even sure I'll remember why I have the tab open, right. Or what, how it connected to other things. Right. So already, you know, within an hour after a call or a day or two, maybe is more fair after a call. It's almost like I woke up from the dream and now the dream makes no sense. Right. Like right. I, all these tabs make no sense. And I end up closing them and feeling a, a slight sense of sadness over a lost, lost something. Um, yes. Right. Can we please start exactly. putting this stuff in a place where we can go back to it? Will we still lose stuff? Of course. And, and I, I think, in some ways, when you mentioned that Google is just, you know, it's created a rabbit hole. So true. The way we share information in that through those networks and things, again, rabbit hole. So true. And yet at the same time, I feel like it's enabled something that we didn't have before too. And I don't want to lose that, which Absolutely. is we don't have to research ever. We don't have to have this have you memorized have to walk to a library and look through the damned card catalog and then right. pray that the book or journal is on the shelf. I mean, wow. Right. That seems it's so insane. weird now. And it really wasn't that long ago. It's not so long ago, 1994, five, somewhere in there, this thing begins as a public utility ish. And that's really, you know, 25 years ago, a little more than that. Right. So it, it's one insane. of those where like learning can change. Right. I, I heard the, I don't remember this at least a couple of years ago. So I'm going to get it a little wrong, but um, a story that was inspiring to me where um, the um, people training to become doctors, they, they'd started to change the way they were to so much information that they need to know. So they're starting to offset and, and instead tell the doctors what resources they can go to on the internet to get the information. And so they can move that out of the class right. classes and bring in, you know, the real more the real human stuff of, of being a doctor. Um, cause there's just too much now, mm -hmm. um, which is also a wonderfully glorious thing that we have learned so much as, as collective humanity. I think we've just over overdone it in the sense of, uh, yeah, I don't need to know what you ate for dinner last night. It was again, spaghetti and that's not helping my <laughs> right? that's yeah, not yeah, yeah. bringing any meaning or value into my life. <laughs> Um, but my doctor having access when I, to the right information, when, when I need it, right. yeah, that that's incredibly meaningful. So how do we get through all that? The tapestry, I think is a good first step, especially for communities that, that are eager for it and don't have it. Would I love to be able to provide people with a, an entire knowledge network where they can curate what's meaningful to them and where mm -hmm. the network itself is, is almost self curating from the crowdsourcing standpoint of people saying, this is valuable, this isn't valuable. And, you know, hollow chain is there to kind of help, help <laughs> eliminate the people or not eliminate, but sideline the people who, who uh, maybe shouldn't be getting the airtime. Uh, yeah. All of that would be wonderful. I'm looking for what's a first step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What can we make, even if it's messy or a little chaotic, it, it is this, could this be a good first step? And it would be, it would even be interesting if my and your representation in the tapestry um, started to function as a better resume, as a, 
and and as a way for people to get to know you and as a way for getting job offers or finding tasks or whatever sure. because because if it knows the questions you're working on and the skills you have uh, and the projects that you've been part of that's a we're already halfway down the road toward you know exposing exp exposing your work life as a linkedin profile exactly yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I saw So what I've been talking to Vincent about is for every answer I have, it should show up on my profile, right? Mm -hmm. For every answer I give. And then that would be pretty much where I would change it is go back to my profile. But conversely, everyone could see that as well. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that is a valuable piece. And, and I guess part of the reason why I'm bringing that up as an, as an example is not everything has to be viewed through the tapestry. Half of the benefit, I think, of doing this project is thinking about ways in which data needs to be structured so that we can have these conversations, whether it's viewed through a layered grid or it's viewed through a, a, an array or a chart or a Kumu map or a, it doesn't matter so much. It's creating conversations right now just around how to organize that, that, that database. And already I found myself saying, hey, I know I'm not a data specialist and I know I don't set this stuff up, but has anybody thought of doing it this way? Or what if we did it that way? And it changes the nature of the conversation because for me, I have an I have a vision in mind of mm -hmm. how I want to use it. And now we're back to why the visions matter. <laughs> like, I have a vision of how I want to use it. And that changes the very nature of the of how the data needs to be structured in order to accomplish it. Precisely. Um, this may be a lousy analogy or it may work for you, but I, when in having conversations about what you were just talking about, I keep going back to the old Viewmaster thing, the stereo. Yeah, I think you know, you with, brought that up before. It's a good example. Say, with let's talk about it again. Is, and, and I first started thinking about it from an idea that Arthur Brock has called game shifting, which is a way to sort of manage conversations and, and change formats during the conversation. So it's like now we're doing speaker and audience. Now we're doing baton pass or token pass. Now we're doing popcorn. Those are all different sort of formats for, yes. for, for yep. sessions, right? Yep. But but you could also then slide in different kinds of tools. And then that was that was a while ago when I was thinking about that as maybe a, a piece of software to fund to to put into the the larger puzzle. But the yeah. more the more I think about it, the more I'm like, so I like this brain thing, uh, even though it's proprietary and I'm sort of trapped in it. But other people like Kumu, other people like uh, Rome, other people like a variety of different tools. What if the frame were like a view master and where when you approach a particular problem question or set of data, you wind up with the right viewer for that particular data. So if, yeah. we, if what you're trying to describe is the flows of value through the, the Columbia River Gorge food is ecosystem, everything mm. from mm. everything from the food networks all the way up to the markets and, far, and farmers uh, and restaurants, then you might want something like Kumu and it would help you to do this and this and this. But at some point at the corner of a Kumu, you might in fact want to flip to Airtable mm -hmm. or, or Bubble to get a, a tabular display with filters and pick lists of, okay, good. So now that I'm here, who are the players who I should be talking to? Mm -hmm. And then, and, and so part of what I'm trying to sort of get, bring words to is, and I think this fits sort of your tapestry, but it, it, it maybe adds a wrinkle where it's not so much a, it's like a meta tapestry or it's like a, a wrinkle in time kind of tapestry because it's not all made of one fabric or one, uh, one, kind, of, one kind of weave. It's in mm -hmm. fact uh, composed of a collage or a patchwork quilt, which is partly why um, I was thinking about the, the big quilt as one of the things that maybe you know, I was busy trying to build, uh, although, Quilting seems like a very soft and inert kind of, of metaphor, but but the patchwork quilt I liked a lot also because it gives you different ways of seeing uh, the things that you're trying to get done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think that that's important, um, and also just for the very fact that everyone thinks differently, right? Yeah. Seeing seeing information in different ways adds value to people. Um, who are trying to use it, who maybe aren't tech savvy and don't like to look at data in structured ways. They want to see it in a flow or they want to see it in, you know, some other visual. Um, you know, so I, I, Vincent and I have been talking about that too. He already has multiple ways. He's already working out in a navigation um, to allow people to just change the view. And this was, and this is kind of emerging as the tapestries come up and the Kumu maps have come up. And I've been working with Jonathan Sand on his um, app, Seriously, which is a, 
star and I've been working on changing it over. It looks um, a little bit like a Jerry's brain, except that you can edit it directly. Just, oh, well, you can do that in Jerry's brain. You can move things around and it also has a, um, a global component and a local component. And anyway, so he, he because he's the coder for it, he mm -hmm. and I've been working on a on a radial or a starburst pattern for it. Um, and then now that he's got a little bit of that down, what he's going to do is um, create a version of it as an app for bubble, you know, and bubble IO. So it can be put on Trove, right? So we've, it's, I'm working on, right? Like I'm working on the tapestry view because really seriously is not quite ready yet. The right. seriously app is not ready yet. And I think we can do the tapestry view sooner. So if we do the tapestry, we start to ask these questions that eventually will end up in seriously anyway. And so you just, I'm trying to, I'm trying to go at it from as many angles as I can to try to get it really the same thing, which is, can we see ourselves? Yeah. You know, can we just get a mirror to start? Let's get a mirror to start and a little bit more of a repository that, that, that is organized in a way that we can find things a little bit better. Um, and, and, you know, whether I end up, you know, accomplishing it through a, a, the tapestry or it ends up being some other initiative. I, this is, this is definitely what I'm working on and I will mm -hmm. continue working on it until I figure out a way. Good. Right, that, Me too. That, yeah. Um, so I, I came here to potential OGM architecture components because I started realizing as we were having these OGM conversations that people kept, com kept coming up with good tool ideas, mm. uh, many of which are open source, some of which are not, but these are mostly open sourcey here. Yeah. Um, and then I have a separate parallel thought called OGM neighbor communities, which has many more things in it. So this is just A through F. Here's fair shares. Here's the scroll yes. bar. So there's a whole bunch of neighbor communities because neighbor communities includes conversation spaces online that are really fruitful and communities that are actually doing something about sense making and whatever. So, so there's a lot more different kinds of things here. Oh my here. gosh. I, but, you know what it makes, I'm sorry to cut you off, but it no, just please. makes me want to put all the neighbor communities in the tapestry. <laughs> so, so funny. Where they should, all land. So funny you should say that. Okay. Um, I did an export from this thought, all of the children mm -hmm. of this thought. And mm -hmm. uh, that is, that is what Vincent sucked into Trove. So oh, you'll, got it. So you'll find everything that's under here is actually in Trove currently because of that thing we did, I don't know, eight months ago. Okay. Um, so, th so there's, there's, you know, these things kind of sort of fit, right? So Got here's it. what open source projects fit o uh, OGM well today is one of the, one of our design questions. And that is next to, um, OGM potential OGM architecture components. And if you had a writable tapestry, that was also your note taking place, you mm -hmm. could, if you thought the way I think, and you might need a completely different tool and a completely different way to do this, maybe it's bubble or, or, or air table, but mm -hmm. you would have a, you would have uh, basically a node connected to your project. That's like, mm -hmm. Hey, what are the potential, uh, uh, architecture components and seriously would be connected in there. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So in fact, I can just for fun. Mm -hmm. Bing, and then uh, go over here and connect this up to seriously and Trove probably. And Trove, yeah. Uh, so let's see, there's lots of different things named Trove. Uh, database service, social shopping. The e Catalyst Trove, one. Impact yeah, or yeah. dictionary. So here we go. And then connect that up to potential architecture components and also connect it to our conversation. So it's linked right there. Um, so, so anyway, then, and what I've been trying to figure out a way to get to is to bootstrap our way to the tapestry and the mosaic by using the tools that we like best and trying to fit them together, right? And so, and so to get there, one of the questions is, okay, Wendy, so which kinds of visualizations really work for you? Is this gonna be Scapel? Is it going to be uh, Kumu's particular kind of visualization? Is it going to be, I mean, you know, and, and there's, and there's too many of these to know and to survey at once. And I don't have, I have yet to form an understanding of like, are there six canonical different kinds of formats? Like there's a system flow diagram. There's a mm -hmm. tree architecture, like, like ancestry.com is a genealogical thing. Mm -hmm. That's a kind of, dis that's a very particular kind of display. Like mm -hmm. what, what's the, what's the minimum set that everything else could be kind of categorized under is an interesting but not essential question. 
Yeah, right? yeah. So, but that, but that then leads us to the different kinds of viewers in the view master yeah, because yeah, yeah. then it's like, oh, I need a Kumu like view or I need a brain like view. It's like, okay, good. I've got some open source components that make up that thing that we can drop into a shared architecture. Yes, right. And assuming everything's interoperable at that point, wave a magic wand, then you can really just put any view you wanted on top. And if you and if you have either incentives or structures for everybody to aim toward, and I call this sort of coding toward the middle or, or designing for the center, mm -hmm. um, maybe that works. And then there's a separate thought here, which um, I think I was just on it. Uh, actually, I, I don't have this, I don't think I have this represented well in my brain, but there's an essay I need to write uh, titled Data is the New Soil because I hate data is the new oil, which is like this popular meme that, mm -hmm. that is all about data extractivism and data aggregators and surveillance capitalism. There's a whole bunch of people saying, we're just gonna capture all, your, this is Facebook's uh, uh, business model, right? And Facebook is one of the most valuable country, companies on the planet, has more humans than China plus India. The contrarian point of view on this is- I like this is about soil fertility. And it's like, mm -hmm. hey, actually- I totally get it. That makes sense, actually, yeah. actually, what we want is for the data to be a layer of soil under, under and separate from the apps. Yeah. So that I don't have the brain, which has a proprietary little brain format for, for its data storage, but rather my brain is like a web browser. I'm cruising above a series of component parts that show up. You know, when, you're, when you click on a link on a, in your browser every day, you send, a, you, you send a request to a server and that server sends out a call across the world saying, servers of the world, I need these 30 parts or these 500 right. parts, send them to right. Jerry's browser over there. And yeah. then I, my browser is gonna catch them all, assemble them nicely and then show me a pretty web page. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a little act of magic that we're doing constantly and we just now take for granted. Why can't the tapestry functionally work the same way, right? And so the, the so, then the call for data, this data resides in, I don't know, uh, the interplanetary file system, distributed databases. I actually don't know. I'm, that's mm -hmm. beyond my pay grade. But <laughs> then it acts as this new layer of fertile soil. And so that when I look at a node about uh, potential tapestry architecture components, and I add a couple things from the brain view and then save it, the next time you come by and see potential tapestry architecture components, you have a little, hey, and Jerry suggested this. Would you like to add it? Or you not. Got it. And yep. then we're then we're into fork and pull kind of territory. Are you yes. familiar with like GitHub's fork and pull? No, I'm not, but I totally get conceptually anyway. <laughs> um, right. So, where yeah. where technology is helping us connect, you know, to things that other people have either suggested for us or that, that they've connected to our things. And so it gives us a little bit of a notification. I'm assuming that's what you mean. Exactly. Um, this is funny. I, I didn't realize I had a different thought about fork and pull. Um, but uh, basically, uh, really simply, uh, GitHub has repos or repositories. So you would open an account on GitHub. You then have a repository. Um, when you're publishing as open source code, I could come in and fork your repo, which means I make a complete copy of your repository and it goes into my account. I can then mess with it, do it. And, and the cost of that is a, some disk storage. Really, the, there's little, no cost to the community, but this is very fruitful because I can now go crazy and make things better. And then I submit a pull request to you if I create a variant that I think is going to be good for everybody to, to use. And you can either say, yes, I'd love to add that, you know, that request get, becomes then part of the main line of code or nope. And then if you feel strongly enough about your pull request, you might actually fork the mm -hmm. entire thing and go and see if anybody will follow you and help you create a new body of code. Yeah, but I've seen the same thing. I think that makes total, right? As soon as I got to, yeah, I mean, I, I must have spent about six months trying to figure out like all the different ways in which this, you know, you could notify, be notified and then add to your thing and, you know, where the privacy ends and the pub, you know, public side begins and it gets yep. messy. But to me, that's where the joy is because your someone else's curation work is now saving me time and effort. Bingo, bingo. And and GitHub is more complicated than that. There's branching and there's a couple other things. And GitHub isn't the only model to do this. But 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 fork and pull is the reason GitHub killed SourceForge. SourceForge was the place where open source projects were being hosted for many years. But it had a different model where basically the owner of the project kind of had like a dictatorial ownership over the project and could say mm. yes, no. Mm. And, and GitHub's model just just thwomped it. And all the projects just went boop, 
over there until Microsoft bought GitHub. Now it's everybody's like, wait a minute. So it's complicated, but the model, that idea of this is how we notify each other. This is how we mm -hmm. improve different bodies of code. I think the model is, is brilliant. Yeah. And I don't know how GitHub handled it because um, I haven't really played around in that space, but I always imagined having, and I went into long conversations with some, some development guys I hired about them. Like, okay, so I, I only want one version of everything though. Ass assuming, assuming the person says, yes, I want to add this to mine. That doesn't necessarily mean that the definition someone else gave a resource or the image someone else gave is bad, right? So how do we decide what comes first? Un, under the millions of variations, I'd rather see it all combined into one resource and see because we're not talking about sets of code, right? right? I'm just talking about, right, like a link to a resource, right? right? But your definition is a little bit different than my definition and is a little bit, of the, you know, and, and the website actually updated their definition and, you know, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, and to see those different variations all presented, that's mm -hmm. fine, right? Um, I think the ways to do that. And then we're getting into Marc Antoine Perron's, you know, version of things of like, how do you just, how does the, how does the computer decide what goes right. first? My answer to that was crowdsource it. <laughs> like right. everybody gets like, this is my favorite version. That one appears at the top. And then if I flag one, obviously that appears at the top for me. Um, you know, to me, those are the kinds of answers that we're eventually going to need. But right. I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit that doesn't need any of that to be solved. You know, I think just having the resource there at all <laughs> is a good place to start. We don't exactly. even have that. Um, yeah. I wrote up in the chat a little ways, um, top of your mast. And, and that comes from, I don't know if you were part of those calls, but we had a couple of calls where, where Pete sort of coined the phrase and I, I, yeah. like, I loved it because yeah. in some sense, if you're in the big tapestry and you're represented in there, you could come away as like this wee little icon somewhere in the middle of the big tapestry or just like a stitch and a pearl. It's like, oh right. man, I'm so tiny. Um, but the top of your mass view says, hey, you are the center of the universe. Yes. And we're now going to show you the tapestry from your point your of view. And that means uh, here are the, here are your most intimate partner organizations and people. Here are the people working in, on your project. And as you go out sort of concentrically, a little bit like an intimacy gradient, are you yeah. familiar with that? Um, uh, no, but that makes the conceptually again makes total sense, right? Yeah. People closest to me, the next, the next layer, yeah. So the intimacy gradient comes out of the original pattern language, I think, is pattern number one twenty seven, and it, it, think of it as who would you invite into your living room, into your bedroom, living room, backyard, yeah. who would you meet at the mall, and who would you meet at the Greyhound station. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and for each of those locations, you have a different sense of how many people should be there, um, whether you trust them or not, what you might say or do uh, in those things. So here's, you know, intimacy yeah. circles in private life, your bedroom, your living room, your mall, the airport, the bus station. Mm -hmm. um, so so anyway, so so this view from the top of the mass, I think, is an important component of how we play and how we see how these things work. Then yeah, I've got I think seeing ourselves alongside where everyone else is, is part of that. Yeah. But what you're saying, I think, um, is one step a little further refined, which is show me, put me at the center and then show all the connections to other, you know, to projects, people right from there. Um, and I, yeah, I would think that would be incredibly valuable. Again, in my, in my mind's eye, that's just another view on the and same data yeah and then and then you wind up running into the problem i think vincent started running into as he started adding functionality to trove sort of along these lines you start becoming that company's intranet because your view of what they've got going is maybe better than their sharepoint repository and then okay do i enter the business of charging them 15 dollars per person per user and becoming their intranet mm -hmm. and intranet is like a web two word from yeah, long, yeah, yeah. So long ago yeah. Yeah. But it's but it but it's like you know SaaS or whatever you want to call it. But but right. do I start becoming their platform for everyday work? Yes, no. And if the if if yes, that's a huge different business, and and yeah. and you become Salesforce or something, right? Right. Um, I mean, so my I immediate answer to that would be no. Yeah. Right, because I, I think I think, and and the reason why I would say that, and that would be the advice I would give Vincent if that's really what he's thinking about, is because there's plenty of that around. We don't need more of that. But it what doesn't we need... mostly work the way we're talking. Right. What we need is it's to missing, focus. It's missing this, this webby this connected view that we're talking about here. Yeah. 
But I talked to a company long, well, a couple of years ago. So really early on in me trying to go, okay, it's time to develop this thing. I talked to a company called Bloomfire, mm -hmm. which has a um, intranet community building kind of thing. It's really had, once I, once I talked to them, first of all, you couldn't curate your own private space. Everything was public to the community. If you, if you uploaded it, it was public, which I was like, all right, immediately, no. Yeah, yeah. But they had a really nice, I, I'm not sure what the technology was they were using on the back end, and it's been too long since I talked to them to, to mm -hmm. remember too many details, but they basically had a really nice way of presenting um, basically a common repository. Right. Um, and then allowing people to have discussions on it, to iterate on it, you know, so it was all contained internally. So if you're one company, that's fine. If you're a collaborative, not so great, right? Because it's, it's, you're not going to be one company buying it for your internal workings, <laughs> you know, you're trying, right. we're trying to do it for these, I, where I'm hearing the need is like Klaus's community, right? And a couple others like his, um, where they have people who are trying to implement something brand new in the field. And I, well, in his case, it's a literal field, but I also mean the figurative field mm -hmm. where people are, are taking a brand new concept and saying, I'm going to try it here and I'm going to try it there. And they're maybe don't live near each other. They don't know each other, whatever, wanting to make, wanting to sense make together, right? right? Some sort of intranet would never serve them because they're not all ever going to be on the same in the same places, but I do think there's an advantage to creating something where they can come together as a community. Now, if that's the new version of an intranet, then okay. But to me, an intranet had in an, the advantage to a lot of companies is that it was walled off. Like it was right. this firewall that, right. And it, that's definitely not what we're talking about, right. right. We're definitely talking about something that then becomes a repository for the public or becomes a repository for the next person who thinks they're interested in trying what everyone else has been trying, whatever the thing is, whether it's new regenerative agriculture techniques or it's something else, and they want to see into the space, they're going to see first, what are people doing? What's the, where's the leading question? Does this fit with what I have been doing? Does my, will my soil, you know, support that? Well, they'll have all these questions and hopefully can make sense of it pretty quickly for themselves, ideally, mm -hmm. right? From the mm -hmm. repository that's there. That's what I'm hearing is needed. Um, and I'm hearing it in multiple places just in the last four weeks presented in my mind that way, saying if we could take a tapestry and combine it with some other things that I've been talking to Vincent about, about a way for people to share and sense make, it's really just two different ways of looking at the same sets of data, um, then that could actually provide a, I mean, it's even better than the tapestry alone, in my opinion, right? Sure. It gives people the, here's what's going on and here's what to do about it. Here's the people you need to talk to, or here's the next thing that needs to happen. Here's the, the person's profile that you then can click on or connect with them on, not just their name, right? right. The tapestry, so the tapestry becomes a, a gateway to all the rest of the information and, 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 and then how to make, take action. Exactly. Uh, one of the things I like about the brain and, and my use of the brain is that I can go to somebody I haven't seen or heard from or heard about for 10 years. And I can, if I, if I curated them into the brain, I can go get a really quick and good snapshot. Uh, probably where did I meet them? Because I often connect people to the events that, where I met them. I have a thought also of people I've met through LinkedIn. I have another thought of people I've met through my brain. I added somebody to it this morning because I got a LinkedIn connection request that said, hey, Jerry, I just saw your talk about using the brain. Would you like to connect and talk? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm like, and, and so I added him to my brain and put him in that, under that thought because I didn't have a lot else to, to go with. Um, but how so there's the, there's another interesting question that's right next to that which is how do we change the culture of i i need to protect myself and sort of be very private or very secret and flip that around to the more i let people know what i'm up to and what i'm good at the more the community benefits and the more probably business i get or some i don't know that's a guess it's a roll of the dice but but more people are aware that they might hire you in to do projects or whatever else but just how open can we promote people to be and do things like Bloomfire force people to be more open by pushing their information into the middle? And is that a good or bad thing? And there's a whole bunch of stuff that 
needs to be kept proprietary or private for privacy reasons that we all know about. And also, unfortunately, um, if I were a woman, my attitudes toward openness and privacy would be substantially different um, from what they are today because I'm a, a white guy and I have privilege in, in the sense of a sense of safety that I think I wouldn't have in other ways, mm -hmm. um, which is which is unfair, but I think I think like in the world as well. Yeah, um, and I think that comes down to the privacy settings around each piece of information that I'm putting in to a tapestry or putting out there to a community, right? right. So if I have control over that, I automatically feel safer. Um, and so if I can set those, so Vince and I were talking about that too, I could set them and this is private just for me. And we're back to that. I'm curating this, this network just for myself. Um, I sharing it with restricted community, you know, with in, in a restricted way with certain communities or certain people or certain whatever. And then I'm, I'm, I'm happy that it goes out into the general public and being able to change those things mm -hmm. as well over time. Um, maybe because you've built trust or because it's, you know, my expertise around this, I, I uploaded a file and when I first uploaded it, it was new and different and I was keeping it proprietary or sharing it with five people. Now it's 10 years old and if it serves someone else, great, you know, <laughs> throw it out there in the public sphere. Um, so I think there's a lot of really good questions around that. But in my, um, in my feeling, we don't need to investigate too deeply into that if we allow the permissions and people can decide for themselves. Exactly. And which, which, requires some super smart people on permissioning of distributed data. Yes. Yeah. A, and, and, and this is where thing. hollow chain blockchain and all that come in because it, it, we're really limited. It's, a, it's much harder to do it with current technologies from what people are telling me and my sense of it, yeah. um, that it'll get much easier um, with, um, with the new technologies that are coming because your personal information actually is your personal information. Right. Exactly. Um, let me go back to the chat for a second, because I put in your questions as well, like what should the axes be for the tapestry? And I, I think we addressed that in the sense of the view master, mm -hmm. in the sense of each view might have or not have axes. It might be a list view or, 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 or whatever else, but, but in some cases you're going to want three dimensions in other cases too. Um, and for instance, in the multi-plane tapestry slash mosaic view, um, there's a reason why what, seeing it in 3D and seeing which people are in which projects, uh, in which organizations connected to which projects for which, in, which strategic initiative. There's a reason to, to want to see that and to see how all the different people connected to this strategic initiative in 3D-ish. Mm -hmm. But then there's a reason that you'd want to go to any one layer and see it in Flatland only. Because, mm -hmm. because I find that navigating like multidimensional information is really, really hard. And hard, this idea yeah. that we're all going to be in a metaverse walking around in avatars with 3D everything, I find like pretty comical. Um, many, many years ago, I was at an event where somebody was going to do a demo of a 3D space. Uh, and they had, you know, the screen in the front of the room. Uh, and I typed into the chat for the room, oh, goody. This is now going to take 10 minutes just to get the avatar set in the right place to talk to the other person, which they could have done with a Google Doc instantaneously. And sure as shooting, it was like, you know, awkward and this and that. And then you have avatar in front of a little screen, which could easily just be a Google Doc that, that they were staring at or a, a drawing or a presentation or whatever. So that, so we lose a lot in, in moving into these metaverse kinds of things that, that I think lots of people are trying to push toward. You know, there's the recently the major companies are buying up gaming companies. They're all being sucked up into mm -hmm. the into the Microsoft and, and everybody else are just buying gaming companies. Because what our future is going to look like like Doom and Fortnite? Yeah. Really? <laughs> I mean, no, seriously. what I picture more is like the Iron Man Marvel movie, you know, where it it when it's worthwhile to see something in its original 3D form, there's a benefit. Right. right. Like when in the movie there's... Avatar, when they look at a model of where things are, the holographic model or the famous one is Minority Report with Tom Cruise doing, you know, gestures uh, yes. to sort to sort through what the precogs have shown him. Yes. Or um, Cloud Atlas, where you see, you know, where they actually become and you can engage with with the stuff that's floating in front of you and yeah. you can move screens to the side or whatever. I think all of that is is. It's kind of like when PowerPoint first came out and everybody wanted to use every transition known to man that it was right, and it just clogged it all up, right? It's figuring out what the best use is for, for that VR, you know, 
interaction for right. us to sense make. We're obviously still figuring it out. Do I think it will have a place? Yeah, I think it's going to have a place just like the tapestry has a place, just like all the other tools kind of have their place. And I, I would be very surprised if the tapestry lasted longer than a year or two, even if we decide that it's valuable. I'm not even sure we're going to decide it's valuable yet. Right mm -hmm. now, it's the conversation that's valuable. And it's the vision of having some shared shared repository to see ourselves better that people are finding valuable. Um, whether I've found the right view or not remains to be seen for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, I think the value is in the conversation and the connections like this one, right? The fact that you and I are working in very similar spaces in terms of what we're trying to envision and how we're trying to get there, I think is super valuable. Um, how we can start bringing those things together so that we are iterating upon uh, on top of each other is interesting to me instead of working a little bit in parallel because i think right. we've been working in parallel i think right. that would be interesting to see if there was a way we could iterate a little bit more part of the um, reason i was really looking forward to this conversation it's like okay mind meld yeah mind meld uh so that that to me and and i want that same thing for everyone else oh you mean these three people are working in this space that i've been working in to me if that happens once I will be thrilled. I will say success, right? Um, and and even better, I suppose, if we don't even know about it, because <laughs> that's, that's even better. Although I'll be sad because I don't even know about it. But you know, it's that kind of thing. You want it just happening, and people to realize that that there's so much. And then the storyline of how many good things are happening, how much work is being done. So so a small subnote maybe, uh, and, and this has to do with sort of um, opinions or belief systems or narratives. Uh, and this is a, one of my beliefs about the future open global mind uh, world or interface that, I'm, that I'd love to be in, that I'd love to use, which is that I would love to have it, have it create a collective tapestry or collective hive mind or collective view of what's going on, but I want to be able to step back and see only my point of view through all of it. I want to be able to, to have it preserve each person's, whether it's the top, the top of mass view, but the top of mass view, one way of thinking about it is it's just a database filter for the entities that are already in there. And we're still all seeing the same entities. It's just a different sort of the entities. And what I'm saying here is a little different from that. It's okay. that I might have a conflicting narrative about why, some, why did the metaverse fail? Uh, you and I in, in 20 years might have very different stories about that. And I'm interested in the tapestry and you may not be but i'm interested in this in this in this system preserving those stories and allowing us to tell those stories better but they might be very different stories that overlap on a third of the plot so so we may yeah. we may have a narrative where a th that third of the narrative i'm like i was with you until you said x and then my story goes this way and your story goes that way right. and we end up over here with very different conclusions but that first third I was completely on board and we, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, right? That's really, really interesting to me. And yeah. we have few ways of making this evident, manifest, visible, present. I don't know what the right word is. Yeah. Does this uh, go back to that, that book, Dawn of Everything, where it's like re retelling the whole A bit, LA, yeah. I mean, right? Graber, Graber's magic also in the death, the first 5,000 years, uh, it, his magic is like, hey, that story that economists have been telling you about the origins of money, it's actually completely wrong. And now mm -hmm. it's like, hey, that story that sociologists and anthropologists have been telling you about the origins of civilization and agriculture are completely screwed up. Um, and I love that. And, and what's funny I is- I love it too. What's funny is these are contrarian views. And one of my the favorite thoughts in my brain, I'll just uh, put it up for just one second. Uh, So contrarians who make or made sense, and it's quite busy. So these humans down here, uh, Doug Engelbart, Lynn Ostrom, mm -hmm. uh, Franz DeWall, Gabor Mate, Ivan Illich, Howard Zinn, Hilary Cottam, Heide Marie Schwermer, Hazel Henderson, uh, Harrison Owen, who invented open space, Hans Mondermann, who invented traffic calming. All these people basically had contrarian ideas ideas that were really controversial in their time. And many of these people like uh, uh, Christopher Alexander, I think he's still alive, but but CA is basically you, a, a cranky paranoid oh, you have, old you guy. you have Bruce Lipton in there? Yeah, I think so. And Nassim Harriman? So where are you seeing uh, Bruce, Bruce Levine? Levine? No, Bruce Levine. Bruce Lipton. Bruce Lipton, where'd you see Bruce the, Lipton? Um, the gen, 
geneticist. So evolutionary biologist, I don't have him under that. I have him under gene expression and a bunch of other things, but he's not part of that. That's interesting. Collection. And this collection is always growing. And every now and then I find somebody and I'm like, ooh, 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 I need to add them to add them to my collection because this is one of my favorite nodes in the whole brain. Yeah. But but one of the really weird and interesting things about curating this is what's the line between a contrarian and a conspiracy mm-hmm. kook? Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and it's really in some cases a fine line. And sometimes a decade separates a conspiracy kook from an actual contrarian from, and then another decade is like common knowledge. Yep. Right. Conventional wisdom. And, and, and I, I, I love that. I love that spectrum. And I'm hoping that yeah. books like the dawn of everything help us drop dysfunctional old narratives and find our way into better ideas. And that's why I curate this. Yeah. I, I to me, one of the great joys for me, I think you're saying the same thing is that if I had something like this and, and we could almost watch from afar, the evolution of, of, you know, of concepts and ideas, um, you know, the, the obvious, you know, the world is flat, the world is round, you know, kind of transfer of understanding and how that permeates the culture. And then that what changes, I love stories like that because we don't usually tell history in that way. It's more dates and people and wars and things. But I find the history of the evolution of understanding being much more interesting, much richer. Absolutely. And there's tons of books out on this and we can't all read them all as part of the problem too. So, yeah. so I, I haven't read Dawn of Everything yet. I've started it, but I did read Against the Grain a couple of years ago, which is James Scott's book about early agriculture. And, and, and Scott is not an anthropologist or or whatever, but he vetted this book for a decade with people who knew all the different fields. And and he came out with this this whole idea that, hey, that the narrative we've got is actually asked backwards. It's wrong. Uh, And I love, I love this book. It's fantastic. So I debriefed it into into my brain as all these different thoughts that are then connected up. You know, Scott reframes barbarians as what civilizers called the outsiders who were actually freer and healthier than the people inside the cities. So I've got that connected to barbarians. Uh, and I then that made me write the barbarians in as the other who got written out of history. Uh, and that I connected that to anarchists and sophists for reasons we can go into some other day. Um, yeah, so why, help me understand what your line was. Like, why would a Bruce Lipton not end up on the list? Uh, because I don't know enough about him. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. he was basically had to leave academia to pursue. He basically was someone who discovered that when he was looking in the petri dishes and trying to figure out what the cells were reacting to and what the what the DNA was reacting to, he realized that it was reacting to its environment, right? Uh-huh. That the that the proteins uh, um, were more important than the than the DNA. So it was basically the beginning of epidemia. You know not epidemiology, epigenetics is the word uh-huh. I was looking for Yeah. Um, before. And so I, I went to a weekend workshop with him and talked to him a bit. Um, he said he was kicked out his basically, you know, his PhD, the data was so obvious that the, that the expression of the genes was reacting to whatever the environment was wow. that um, his professors couldn't, couldn't absorb it. Right. And they basically told him he must be wrong and his data must be wrong. And so he left. So <laughs> guess what? Boop. Done. Mm. It's just interesting, right? It's like yeah, all these people. It is. It is. And I feel like I'm finding them in every sector of society. There right. are people who've been pushing the boundaries in this way and having to almost leave the system. Yep. in order to pursue the new idea. And I find that fascinating. And I would love to, I would love for there to be a place where these people could come together or have a voice, you know? And yet, how do you make sure those people have a voice and not the total kooks? Exactly. exactly. And, and, and who gets to make that call, I, you know? Yes. So here's your post, my story in the birth of everyone's wisdom, which points to Randy Pausch's final lecture. And so, mm-hmm. I, so I read your post and then debriefed it into my brain. Right. So you're pointing to the biology of belief, which I think is one of Lipton's books, His books. Yep. where he says we are not victims of our genes, et cetera, et cetera. I think you quote that in your piece. Yes. And so I called it out as a quote out of the book and as something that you're quoting. So that's how I do that usually. I gotcha. Um, and then you're quoting Randy Pasch's final lecture. And uh, let's see, this comes from The Alchemist. I, mean, I got to meet Paulo Coelho once years ago. 
Oh, how fun. Uh, yeah, very interesting. Super, super cool guy. So anyway, so that's, I'm trying to figure out how to preserve the express, and I'm going to borrow a phrase from Arthur Brock here, the expressive capacity that the brain gives me in doing what I'm showing you right this second, so that all of us could do it without having to master something that's as scary looking as this brain thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So one of the questions I have active is how can we make something one step more complicated than Instagram or Twitter? <laughs> bazillions of people seem to be perfectly happy using, including <laughs> hashtags with your metadata. Yeah. Right. If, if so many people can be doing that happily and flooding the airwaves with like cat pictures and what I had for breakfast and really interesting ideas. Yeah. What little thing can we do to bring that into the middle to create a shared understanding? Yeah. Place? Some meaning around all of that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, for the person who just wants to post cat pictures and, and, you know, and what they ate yesterday or what they baked five days ago, or right. Then, then the platform you and I are envisioning or the experience you're envisioning isn't for them or isn't for them in that moment. Yeah. Right. What we're, what we're asking is for people to go back and remember that it's their connection with other people that matters, that it's, um, if they really have a problem in their lives, if they really have solutions that need to be found, and if we're really going to tackle the troubles that are coming all of our way and are already having to deal with and larger scale, we need to be doing better. And what does better look like? And how can we make that happen faster? That's right. To me, that's what OGM is really in total trying to help each other do. Right. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and people either individually working on it, or at least just interested in talking about it and supporting others. Um, I think, right. That's never, we don't want that to become a Twitter space and the Twitter space is never going to become what we're talking, right. Those both will exist beside each other. And I think right. if we give people an alternate option, then for those who are ready, they'll adopt it early. And for those who are, you know, need to come along later, I think people are generally for the last 10 years I've been feeling this, even when I was giving parenting classes, people want truth. They, they, like, they like thinking about things in terms of stories. They like thinking about things in terms of relationship. Yep. And, they, and they didn't wanna think about things in terms of developmental stages anymore. That wasn't working. You know, it didn't help them understand their child better or connect to their child better. All I know is you're supposed to go to school. So get up and get your shoes on and go to school. <laughs> And when we would say to people, look, if your child's resisting, then there's stress mm -hmm. there. Maybe try reading a book. Oh, we don't have time to read a book. Right. We had one woman come back and say, I read a book and she got ready so fast. We actually had extra time. Right. So because it was the connection that that was missing. Yeah. So I think, you know, to me, the tapestry is less. It's partly we get to see ourselves. It's validating, but it's more that it's about we get to see each other. And that's right. what I was asking about the narratives and opinions and how they fit into your view of the tapestry. That's exactly why yeah. is that is that I think if you make room for people's points of view and you give them powerful ways to express them. And then if Marc Antoine unleashes his idea loom and hyper knowledge <laughs> software on them to derive like how the logic behind their assertions. ooh, that's a little scary, but still, yeah, um, we, we, <laughs> then we're getting someplace sort of interesting, right? Yeah, now, now what will give people with very differing points of view the confidence to post into a shared medium? I don't know. I don't know. And there's, and there's a bunch of people who are making decisions based on acts of faith that are not, that are, that are logical only if you think acts of faith are logical, right? That, 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 that they've, made a, they've made a jump that says, this is true and this is true, which are assertions I would not agree with. But they're building a set of belief system out of those acts of faith that is that is logical under those assertions, but those assertions are are like pulled out of thin air in some way. Yeah, it's like wow. So and that those to me are exciting conversations, right? But I don't know. They're scary conversations because how do we get in there? What do we do? Um, I have a I didn't I got to do an interview uh, with Daryl Davis, uh, who is yeah. the musician who's got a garage full of KKK robes. And yeah. the reason I interviewed him like right up front was um, he's figured out how to listen carefully and for a long period of time, very patiently with respect and melt other people. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's not that he convinces them of, of anything or, or rather 
his demeanor and behavior convince them that he's worth getting to know and worth being a friend. Yeah. And, and yeah. partly because he didn't try to pry them away from their belief system. And I'm, I'm projecting a little bit here because he's got a complicated life and he's, you know, he's really worked hard to, to, to do what he does. I'm, I'm astonished by it. But. No, no, but I think that, I think the point you're making about connecting with other people happens best through listening. P every, right. Again, and it's back to everybody wants to be seen and heard, right? Everybody wants, right? And, and when we're able to do that, make someone else really see, feel seen, feel heard, then they can start listening. Exactly. Otherwise we're all talking and no one's listening. Precisely. Yeah. So here's the interview that I did with Daryl, although the transcript is not quite finished yet. Here's a link to the draft document. Uh, and then here's something I wanted to bring in a moment ago <clears throat> that I have, which is um, under my beliefs. And I've got up here on the pin board, I have my beliefs and it's messy. There's a whole lot of them here, but one of them is this idea that stories are more fundamental than facts. Mm -hmm. And that uh, I've got dysfunctional stories we often believe. I have this thought about the scripts that we have running in our minds that kind of own us in some way that we don't understand. And then mm -hmm. a really important one is we are in a titanic battle over the narratives in our heads and we always have been. And this mm -hmm. is where sort of politics and power come in. Mm -hmm. Because this is, this is what politics is about. It's about shifting the, the narratives in a bunk. And this is partly what religion does as well. It's shifting the narratives of, of very large numbers of people so that you can run a whole new economic system or governmental approach or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Anyway, we've been we've been going for uh, a little over an hour, I think, an hour and ten or something, because we I think we were ten minutes into the first hour. I'm happy to stop here. Interested in what questions you have and what feedback you have? Could go longer on this conversation. Whatever you like. I have no. Yeah, I I have a, I have a, um, I have something else I have to move on to. So yeah. we should probably end soon, but, um, yeah, if you want feedback, I think, um, right off the top, it's so, I actually made an effort to browse Jerry's brain before this call with yep. my questions in mind and struggled yep. and, and where I struggled was, um, I, I didn't have enough information in my own mind behind each thought to make sense of it on the fly. Yep. And so it made it very hard to know where to go from where I started. Right. It so it starts into, right. And so it was it, very fascinating for me to see where you landed because you were like, Oh, this is, this is the node that we really need to start from. And I was starting from a completely different one. So I had searched communities and did not land on that network of communities that were, that were um, central to OGM, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. Or if that had come up in the search, I just didn't know to click, you know, I didn't think to click on it for whatever reasons. So it's fascinating, so helpful and so interesting to connect with you around Jerry's brain. And it makes me as maybe a follow-up conversation for some time. How can we, let's say I keep moving forward and developing the tapestry. And I feel like Wendy Elford has a role to play in like how we can catalog stories in that, for instance. Um, when Finity has a role to play in terms of how we listen to each other is and how we connect with each other is so much around how we see each other and feel seen, feel safe to share things. Right. Um, and then where does the where does Jerry's brain and tapestry inter interweave? Not just the idea you have for the layering, but the but the how, you know do we put links right? in inside of a tapestry to go out to Jerry's brain at the key at key spots where Jerry's brain has a lot to offer. That would be the simplest version. That's, the, that's totally the starting point, right? That's, that's the simplest thing that we can do today. But then, but then in the, in the view master view, what does it look like when tapestry and brain are next to each other? That's like yeah, really, really, that's interesting. Where it gets really fun. It gets totally fun. I just, I just pasted a link to the, the thought I created for this conversation. Thank you. So you can now go follow up in the brain, all the things, not all of them, but many of the things that we touched while talking here, which I'm, I'm interested in whether they'll make more sense to you now, because, because I think, I think one of the value sources of these conversations is I'm just, people get to sort of marinate in me telling stories around the brain and understanding how I use it and what the context is. Yeah. And maybe I think that makes the brain more valuable to them afterward as a standalone resource, but I don't know. I'll let you know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 that would be valuable. Um, yeah. Cool. Awesome. This has been fabulous. This has been so fun. Thank you. Stacy, do you want to uncloak? Say anything?
Nope, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> cool. You're still recording. <laughs> I'm still recording. Wait, I can fix that.